Now, without any further delay, let's begin our business call to action webinar once again, overcoming external constraints to scale an inclusive business. At this time, I will hand our presentation over to your first speaker, Tatiana Bessarabova. Tatiana, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jessica. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Like Jessica said, my name is Tatiana and I'm the Knowledge and Partnerships Lead for the Business Call to Action. Business Call to Action is a global leadership platform and is a unique multi-stakeholder partnership that is supported by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, the United Kingdom Development um, Department for International Development, the United States Agency for International Development, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Government of Finland, and the United Nations Development Program, which hosts the Secretariat. Our platform also involves the collaboration of leading global institutions such as the United Nations Global Compact, who is also a partner on today's webinar. BCT is happy to be supporting today's discussion with our long-term partners, the Practitioner Hub for Inclusive Business, which provides a space for practitioners to connect, share experiences, and gain new insights to help their inclusive business ventures grow. You can learn more about the Practitioner Hub at businessinnovationfacility.org and follow them on Twitter at InclusiveBiz. And today, just like I said, our other partner is the UN Global Compact, and I'm happy to uh, welcome Michelle Lau, the Manager for Human Rights and Social Responsibility at the UN Global Compact. And Michelle, over to you for a brief introduction. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Um, so I'd just like to give, for those of you who are not familiar with the Global Compact, we are the UN's Corporate Sustainability Initiative calling on companies everywhere to align their strategies and operations with 10 universally accepted principles in the areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. And we also encourage companies to take action to support broader UN goals and issues. It is the main initiative for engagement with the UN um, of the private sector and business and the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the world with over 8,000 companies and 4,000 non-business signatories based in 160 countries. So we're very pleased to be hosting, co-hosting this webinar with Business Call to Action and the Practitioners Hub for Inclusive Business. Obviously, inclusive business is very relevant to the Sustainable Development Goals, which the UN member states unanimously adopted at the end of September. I just want to also mention two tools that you'll see up here on the slide that we've developed in partnership um, with key development partners. Uh, the first is with Oxfam, and it's called the Poverty Footprint Tool. This is a partnership-based tool which helps companies and civil societies work together to really understand their impacts on people living in poverty, so understanding corporate impacts, both positive and negative, all along the value chain. Um, it helps companies think about their business models and innovate their business models to create more long-term value for people in society as well as for their business. And it also helps promote joint learning and, and also transparency and accountability. Um, and obviously, goal, these tools help contribute to goal one of ending poverty, but also many other goals as they take a multidimensional view. So goal three on health, five on gender equality, decent work and growth, goal eight, um, inequality, goal 10, goal 16 on, on, on peace and justice. So these are all, um, you know, intimately kind of tied into the, our, our definition of inclusive business at, and, and sustainable development. So, and on the right-hand side, you'll just see a, a primer that we developed with Business Call to Action on an implementing inclusive business models. It's a very short um, four-page um, document which really helps um, underline some, what it is and, and some of the common challenges and pitfalls. Um, so I just wanted to flag those two resources. Um, and if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to contact me or, or Tatiana on these, and I'll hand it back over to Tatiana. Thank you very much, Michelle. I also wanted to briefly mention the page where you can find more resources on scaling your inclusive business. Um, it's at inclusivebusinesshub.org, and you can also um, access the webinar page at b3-scaleweb. You'll find all of the publications that Michelle mentioned and also additional publications developed by the Business Call to Action and the Practitioner Hub. 
And I also welcome everyone to join us um, on Twitter. Uh, we have our hashtags right here, BLC Biz, Inclusive Biz, and SDG Biz. And we also have our handles on the left-hand side. Just like I said, uh, Business Call to Action um, members are pioneers, really, and um, innovators in the space of inclusive business. And today, today's uh, webinar is an example of how we can uh, learn from each other, share lessons, and forge partnerships to improve scale and increase development impact of these models. So today's webinar is an example of how our companies and practitioners can learn from each other and gain new insights into their inclusive business ventures and help them grow. Today with us, I'm pleased to have uh, three business call to action member companies that are also Global Compact members. They are Pronaca, Nova Nordisk, and IKEA. And today, on behalf of Pronaca, we have Gabriela Zambrano, who is representing Javier Tobar Mauri, who, who unfortunately could not be with us here today. But uh, we're thankful to have Gabby to walk us through um, the innovative work that Pronaca is doing in, um, in Ecuador. Today, also with us, we have Dorothy Awegi, who is the business base of the Pyramid Project Manager at Nova Nordisk, and also promotes the, the project manager of Better Than Cotton Project at um, better cotton projects at IKEA. Without further delay, I would like to hand it over to our moderator, Tom Harrison, who is the technical director at DFIS Business Innovation Facility, who will lead today's discussion. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm, I am indeed technical director of uh, Business Innovation Facility. Um, I also have a strong association with the practitioner hub. And um, it's great to be here, um, really, to, to make sure that we have a really rich conversation today. I think the best thing we can do is to get straight into our presentations. And Pramod has very kindly volunteered to go first. So, Pramod, if I can hand over to you, uh, please tell us all about the um, Better Cotton Project at IKEA. Now, I'm now wondering whether we actually have Pramod. We are, I'm afraid we're having some technical issues today, as so those of you who joined us early might, might know. Hi. Uh, I'm here. But Excellent. Very good. There was, a, there was a silence there, which made me worry, but, 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 but great to hear your voice. Uh, Pramod, uh, if you, yeah. Pramod, this is Jessica. If you can just um, uh, tell me next slide. Do you have a copy of the slides on your computer? No, I um, don't have the the slide ends on the sixth, which I don't have it. Okay. How about um, I, I volunteer then Dorothy to give her presentation. Uh, Jessica, if you can try and work with um, Pramod to get him back on visuals, then we can uh, enjoy that properly in a minute. Dorothy, I'm going to jump you in, jump you up the queue, please, if you wouldn't mind giving your presentation. Oh, I don't mind. Thank you. I don't mind. So, uh, do I go? Yes, I please. Go? go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, today, uh, I'm really glad to share with you uh, on overcoming external constraints to scale in inclusive business. We deal with um, improving access to diabetes care in Kenya under the BOP project. And um, one of the highlights for us this year is that uh, in 2014, which is last year we were ranked second in access to medicine index. The access to medicine index is um, a publication that is uh, published every two years by the Access to Medicine Foundation, which is an independent body. And normally they rank the world's 20 largest research-based pharmaceutical companies according to uh, their efforts to improve access to medicine in low- and middle-income countries. So as Novo Nordisk, we are very glad to come in at number two. And this is courtesy of the BOP project, which, um, which I work with in, um, in Novo Nordisk. So um, what are some of the external constraints facing us as BOP in Kenya? These are things that are beyond us. There's generally a low level of awareness uh, about diabetes among the population, especially the working poor. So we have a lot of myths and misconceptions about diabetes. It's caused by 
uh, this virus is caused by uh, somebody looking at you badly. So we have a lot of myths about the disease that we need to dispel that can't happen overnight. It will take a long time for us to be able to have facts about diabetes in our population. And then you also have uh, generally low income in our people to afford this chronic medication on a month-to-month -month basis. Diabetes is an expensive disease. You need to see the doctor and have these diagnostic tests done. And because of low income, some patients fall out of care. And also our health systems, as you know, are burdened with TB, malaria, HIV, and all these are communicable diseases. And on top of that, now we are seeing a rise in non-communicable diseases, and this is including diabetes. So we have a dual burden of disease, and, uh, and we are just not able to uh, address both of them uh, at the same time. And then, of course, uh, the policy dilemma, because we've had an over a history of, of a focus on the communicable diseases. There have been a problem, we agree, but then now where do we put our efforts and funds as we look uh, forward? Is this still on NCDs only or both? So there's sort of a policy dilemma that uh, we are seeing our country having to shift and put more focus on NCDs, even though it wasn't a problem uh, earlier on. And so what are some of the approaches ways that we have used as DOP to overcome these constraints. Of course, we can't do it all. First, uh, in, the, in where we work, we've, intens we've intensified diabetes screening and awareness. And uh, we do this by the local communities. We do this by the local media stations. So when you have an activity, we try to really make some noise about diabetes. Come and screen. It only takes five seconds to know uh, your blood sugar level, Hopefully, hoping that these people can be able to now seek and demand care if we raise the level of awareness. And of course, uh, we have reduced the cost of insulin and we work closely with our distributors to try and limit the price markup they put on the vial. Ideally, the vial shouldn't be able to, uh, should be able to be affordable to our working poor. So we sort of uh, reduce the, the price as novel notice, but you also have to work with the distributors to, to sell to them the idea of not wanting to make too much uh, out of the vial of insulin. It is an essential medicine, as you know. And we've also engaged with uh, Kenya Defeat Diabetes Association. It's a small and a young group that has come up under the BOP project, and they go all over the country getting diabetes patients together, working with them to start some microfinance initiatives, and hopefully they will end up in some form of community health financing schemes to enable the working poor to afford medication every month um, uh, if they form a group, that is. We also provide trainings at target primary health facilities to increase the healthcare professionals' knowledge on diabetes. There's been, um, in our training in Kenya, there's a big gap. Uh, diabetes is not a very big focus, so when the uh, HCPs or healthcare professionals leave school, they have limited knowledge on diabetes. And so because it's a disease that's not like malaria, we need to really invest in their knowledge and train them and tell them this is what you do when you have a patient who has sugar, who needs insulin, who has a food problem. So it is continuous. So we try and have targeted training at the primary health facilities where most patients can access because the physicians are very few and not patients, not all patients can come and see the physician. So we have to look lower. How can we empower the uh, lower level of clinicians to handle diabetes? And then, of course, we are, work with the Ministry of Health very closely. We have a Department of Non-Communicable Diseases. We support them in the initiatives, and we are always inviting them to our, our BOP activities. In fact, they are our partners in the project. In all, all that we do, they are aware, and we also, uh, in this way, advocate for diabetes to be in the, high in the agenda of the Ministry of Health in Kenya. Um, so if I go to the next slide. So the BOP essentially is just a, a project that aims to improve access to diabetes care for the working poor. Of course, the poor that uh, we target are those who have little income who can afford to at least pay for their medication, even though it's uh, reduced, so that we can sustain the project. And uh, the BOP project was actually established in 2010, but we started rolling it out in 2012 in Kenya in two counties only. And um, after six months, we were able to scale up to another 14 counties, yeah, and then now we are in 27 counties in total. And we have achieved this through a network of using the faith-based hospitals in Kenya. You know, in Kenya we have the public hospitals and we have the mission hospitals run by the faith-based community. So when Novo produces insulin in Denmark, it's packaged and transported to Kenya. Then Philip Pharmaceutical down here, they, after importing it, they sell it to 
Missions for Essential Drugs and Supplies, MEDS. MEDS is a sole distributor for our faith-based hostels in the whole country. And then the drug is able to reach the faith-based organization. But as a project, we look beyond the product because that is not the way we can strengthen the systems. We're able to work in these facilities to ensure they have the basics. They have a glucometer, they have uh, diagnostic uh, equipment to help them uh, take care of diabetes patients. So we look beyond the product and support them to have quality diabetes care. And then you have the Ministry of Health, which is in charge of um, um, looking at the trainings between these facilities because they're the policy makers. We need to be in line with the diabetes uh, treatment protocols in Kenya, and we're able to work with them. They're able to help us train healthcare professionals and organize and endorse our trainings. And then lastly, we have the Kenya Defeat Diabetes Association. It's a patient group, very active in creating awareness and in um, training lay, PLA educators to be able to reach out to other patients. And in the end, we reach the person with diabetes in the country. So the scaling we've had is actually uh, through the faith-based networks. Like I said, we're able to now to be in 27 countries. Of course, we hope to have the resources to reach 47 counties. But where we are at, we have seen the reduced price for insulin stay because patients are now able to afford insulin. They used to uh, buy it at four times the price, and then we're able to have uh, more institutions stocking insulin. So if my grandmother in a remote village had to come to Nairobi to get insulin, I would increase her cost. But right now, she can get it in the next near nearby hospital, and that is a great achievement for us because we had very few facilities stocking insulin, but now we have uh, most of them stocking insulin. Then we also have trained very many healthcare workers, actually over 600 healthcare workers, to treat diabetes patients, and we've had more patients come on insulin, and of course we have more patient uh, uh, support groups to, uh, to encourage the diabetes patients to, uh, to stick to their treatment so they can get good outcomes in the end. So we work for the patient. We are patient-centric company. We believe that uh, the diabetes patient is our employer, and the benefits we've seen through the project is increased awareness of diabetes. We want patients to be screened, and if they have diabetes, to come early uh, uh, to treatment. In Kenya, the problem we are having is patients come when they have complications already. These complications are very expensive to treat, and these people are poor. So we want to try to screen more and get people into treatment early. And after they get into treatment, they are able to access a, a healthcare professional who knows how to treat diabetes, which wasn't the case before. And we also have insulin not going out of stock and available in most of our facilities. And because we have the patient support group uh, being formed, patients are able to manage their, their disease at home and also by seeing the doctor at the hospital. So it's a dual approach. The patient is the best doctor when you have diabetes. So these patients, if they're empowered, they're able to manage their, their, their disease better. And we are happy that the patients are benefiting under the BOP project. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Dorothy, thank you very much. That was excellent. A uh, very thought-provoking and thorough presentation. And in fact, before we move on, there's a question that somebody has posed, which I think it would be good for you to, to deal with now, which is the extent to which you use technology, and especially digital technology, to overcome some of the external constraints you talked about. Perhaps you could just say a couple of words on that before we move on. Um, maybe if I go back to some of the constraints I um, highlighted. Yeah, so the um, question is around the extent to which you use technology to help you overcome those constraints. I think in the pipeline now is we are, we are partnering with uh, the largest uh, telecommunication company, Safaricom, and uh, I, I believe we will be rolling, rolling out an SMS program. You know, in Kenya, the phone is almost everybody has a phone, even the old people have phones. So we are hoping that this will help, will, uh, using the, the mobile phone technology, you can be able to pass health messages uh, going forward in 2016. And that is a project that has, I think is being sponsored from, uh, from HQ. But before then, we have not really had a lot of uh, digital use because our patients, uh, like I said, are the working poor. But now we are targeting to use mobile phones to be able to, uh, to create more awareness about diabetes. That's very good. Thank you very much. Um, so now let's move on to Pramod. And um, Pramod, if, if you can please give us your presentation. Uh, uh, hi, just to introduce myself. Um, I'm Pramod. Uh, I work for IKEA uh, as a cotton leader. 
and I'm responsible for all the cotton activities within IKEA. And my presentation is regarding what we call cotton from more sustainable sources, and this is about the IKEA's journey on cotton from more sustainable sources. But the most important thing is that why cotton is so important to IKEA. As you know all, uh, in uh, IKEA is a uh, um, small and based uh, region of uh, from the Sweden, uh, which is traditionally very very um, resource uh, uh, very very less resource region uh, where is only woods as well as the stones, and hence people are very very conscious of what they use, uh, and they believe in conserving and preserving the resources. And we also believe that uh, whatever we do, the, it should be about creating better everyday life for many people. And in the many people are also included the farmers who are part of the supply chain of IKEA. Now, what does the supply chain look like? If you look at it, it's a uh, it's the inverse pyramid shape with uh, roughly around uh, 250 million people working uh, in the cotton value chain, including uh, and something like 17 million farmers in the regions where we source from. Now, the most interesting part around here in the supply chain is that the upper deck uh, of the inverse pyramid, in majority of the cases in many parts of the world, are invisible part of the supply chain whereas the lower deck has some visibility because there is a value addition process. So a lot of effort has gone around improving the value chain process uh, through uh, various brands and various people have their own uh, compliance requirement, there is a technology part of it and all those developments which is taken place. But what has been the invisible part of the supply chain, they have language somewhere in between. Now, to do something around it, almost a decade ago, we went on a journey to find out what's the situation in the world, in the cotton farming. And somebody within IKEA carried out a survey of almost 50 countries to find out what's the situation. And what came out was that there is an excessive use of chemicals, there is excessive use of water, there is as I say it, not so decent working condition in the cotton farms. And eventually the farmers in many parts of the world are not making enough money and hence their livelihood is at a stake. And we thought of doing something around it. And that's when we started our journey on cotton from more sustainable sources. Now the journey had two components. One was around doing something at the farm level but that's not enough. It was important to complete the loop. And what I mean is to connect it to the market. And hence, we have started our journey by creating the supply of cotton from more sustainable sources. But we also, could also went on to create a demand on ourselves that we have to use that cotton in our products. And we have started creating demand within the supply chain. While doing this, uh, what came out was that uh, we not only uh, create um, uh, the demand within the supply chain, but we also influence the livelihood of the farmers. And as per the result of 2014, um, uh, 2014 cotton season, what comes out is that almost there is a fertilizer reduction by 49% there is a water reduction by around 10%. There is a, uh, um, there is a gross margin improvement of around 25% for the farmers. But what it also means is that we needed to use that product in our supply chain, in our products. And we set a goal for ourselves that by end of financial year 2015, all the cotton which we use has to be in cotton from more sustainable sources. And as we had reported uh, some time back, we were able to achieve that goal of uh, reach, uh, all our products from 2015 onwards are in cotton from more sustainable sources. Now the important part here is that 
it would have been much easier for us to, say, to take a small uh, range within our products and convert it into cotton from more sustainable sources. Or it would have been much easier for us to work in a small region or a small geography uh, in the cotton growing regions of the world and improve it. But we said, until and unless the sustainable cotton farming is mainstreamed in the world, it's not going to create a tipping point either for the market or for the cotton growing as such. And hence, we said that let's not do what is easy. Let's do what is right. And hence, we decided to convert all our products in cotton from more sustainable sources. It's about mainstreaming the cotton from more sustainable sources. And it's about reducing also the use of cotton by improving techniques and alternative materials. This also means that once we have reached the 100% the, the, uh, of our products being from cotton from more sustainable sources, where do we go from now? And that's where the interesting uh, question begins. For us, as far as IKEA is concerned, it means primarily that, as everybody says, that reaching 100% is some kind of journey, but being 100% is a super important and super difficult job. And we have to be there at 100% as we have made promise to ourselves. We have to bring in an element of continuous improvement, both at the farm level, but also uh, at the production level. We also have to make sure that since our customers uh, are from all the, uh, all, the, all the economic background, and as well as we side with the many people, hence people, irrespective of their wallet sizes, have to have the access of the products made from sustainable resources. And that was the IKEA part of it. But at a much larger level, we are supporting BCI in achieving its goal of 2020, which is 30% of the global production has to be in better cotton and as well as the cotton from more sustainable sources. By 2020, at least 5 million farmers have to be part of uh, this journey. Roughly around 9 million hectares of cotton grown in the world uh, have to be in cotton from more sustainable sources. And we do this so that the sustainable cotton uh, production practices becomes the norm. And as I said, this journey is about creating the new norm in the uh, cotton production. It's also about transforming the textile industry where the, 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 at least the known value chains, and in, whether it's the international value chain or the domestic value chains, process the sustainable cotton and make the products out of it. Uh, going forward, but if we think about it, what was it um, that worked for us? I will say that it is early a startup. It is about thinking much ahead, almost a decade ago when we started this journey. It is also about creating the volume, create the volume of the uh, cotton from more sustainable sources. It is about linking the supply chain from farming to ginning to spinning to weaving to processing and finally to the finished product. I think one of the things which we say, and I believe which has worked in favor of, uh, of uh, in achieving our goal has been to create the non-competitive forum where learnings can be shared across, where best practices can be uh, adapted to the specific situation, where best practices are shared. It's also about perseverance. It's not a short-term solution, but we have to look beyond the horizon. Long-term, uh, really, we need to think from it. I also think that it's important that at least within a company framework or within a corporate framework, there is a buy-in from the top, and that helps quite a bit in, in, in taking this journey forward. Uh, and that's what uh, we are in the process uh, of doing it, and we will continue our journey. And as one of our uh, business leaders says, it's not about ticking the box that we have achieved it. 
it's about creating a change both at the farming level but also in the textile industry as such where the, 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 the many people say last person but I say first person in the value chain of cotton which is a cotton farmer becomes visible as a, a, along with the other value chain actors and he is valued and his life improves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pramod. Um, uh, it's a really um, amazing story of, of ambition and of, um, of, of scale, which is one of our topics today. Clearly, you have, um, you know, you've started off with a vision, which is, is to go straight to scale, as you said, rather than starting with small pilots or individual um, product lines, which is, which is fascinating. Um, just before we move on, we have, we have a question, which I think you could perhaps take now, which is around the, the actual countries where you operate. Um, I guess linked to that, I'm interested to know, you know, you, you're creating demand for sustainable cotton. Um, to what extent are you involved at the producer end? Um, so link, linked to the sort of which countries question, if you could just give us a flavor of what some of the activities that you support look like really, um, you know, within the producer countries, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, as far as the producer companies, uh, countries are concerned, uh, to name a few, all the top cotton producing countries in the world, so for example, India, China, Pakistan, Turkey, uh, to certain extent U.S., Brazil, uh, the activities are going on. And one of, a few of the activities where we are involved uh, along with our partners are about creating the awareness about sustainable cotton, creating the awareness around reducing the uses, creating the awareness around reducing the cost of the cultivation, creating awareness about how essential it is that the farmers think about the water issues, the health issues, uh, and related issues around the decent work. And these are part of the activities which goes on uh, as a part of the project process. As a part also, there is a verification activity or assurance model which is there. And mind it, the important part here is that in world, 75% of the cotton grows in the countries where land holding is roughly around one to five hectare. And in that part of the world, the journey has not been towards excluding uh, farmers for not taking every step as a qualification measure, but encouraging them to take the more steps, where even if they have taken, say, uh, for example, uh, three out of five steps, encourage them to take the rest of the remaining two steps. So it is about being inclusive in the nature. Obviously, there is a minimum requirement around which they have to work, but it is about being more inclusive. And, and I always say this, and this is a part of the reasoning which we are trying to build over it. And that's the process which we carry out all along in different parts of the world. And I forgot to mention that Africa is a big part of our journey through our programs in that in African region. So all the major cotton growing countries part of it. That's great. Thank you very much. There's a lot of richness here. I want to come back to you in a minute. But first of all, I'd like to hear from our third company. Um, now, unfortunately, our, our main presenter is not able to be with us today, um, as Tatiana mentioned, but we're very grateful to, to, to Gabby, who's going to uh, talk us through the presentation. So, Gabby, can I hand over to you, please? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Stronger Supply Chain Corn in Ecuador. This project um, has a vision. Our pro purpose is to feed well by generating development in the agriculture sector. We work with um, agricultures and with inclusive persons and we invoked or we talked um, in our proposal to feed well by generating the development in the agriculture sector. The initiative approximately uh, 500 small corn farmers sign contracts as qualified suppliers and decide the following. Finance services so they can access high quality input at seeds, fertility science, machinery, and more. Technical assistance in order to assure that productivity, 100% uh, final product purchase, and the official price assuring their income. 
This is what we call the success circle. Benefits, small farmers, better income, technical training to improve their main activity, other training so they can make a better use of their money, and para, uh, for Kanaka, high quality corn, our main raw material, stable supply of corn, social and economic development according as to our purpose. Uh, main challenges, bad pass experience, middlemen, low, low productivity, lack of basic education, bad usage of their new income, how to measure the social impact. And that is, that is. Okay, Gabby, thank you very much for that. Um, um, it's uh, fascinating to have uh, a contrast really between a, a large company like IKEA, which is a user of agricultural produce at one end of the value chain and uh, influencing um, across a whole, a whole range of sectors, and then another company which is so directly involved with producers. Um, but before we talk more about agriculture, I would like to return to health um, and, and, and have a conversation um, about the role of government and companies and how they work together. So, Dorothy, if I can bring you back in, um, you know, health, and, and, I, and I do understand that there are, um, there are issues around that you're dealing with in terms of where governments prioritize certain health needs. But, you know, to what extent can you as a private company really make an impact on the whole health system in Kenya? And if you don't, is, is your scale of, of operation going to be severely limited? Um, thank you very much uh, for the question, Tom. Um, of course, as uh, Novo Nordisk, uh, it's not possible for us to, uh, to be alone and make a great impact, and we realize that. So we have uh, approaches to work at the global level and also at the local level and with other partners. Uh, for example, uh, as a member of the NCD Alliance, globally we also work with the NCD Alliance Kenya chapter so that when the groups that uh, tackle NCDs come together, we have a larger voice. So, for example, when the uh, NCD, uh, the, when they launch their strategy, there are partners like us who sponsor the strategy to disseminate information about NCDs, including diabetes, not only to uh, ourselves but to the government officials and the people of Kenya. So we work anytime we have a chance to work with the, the local uh, stakeholders for diabetes and hypertension and cancers, we jump right in. And when we have initiatives globally that are targeting to address issues of access to, access to essential medicine, we also jump in as Novo Nordisk. So the strategy is to uh, be involved at, 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 at both levels so that you can be able to, have a, uh, to be a voice among the many who are advocating for NCD. NCD um, uh, NCDs to be taken seriously in this part of the world. So, like I say, it's not just Novo Nordisk alone. We have to work with other people, and we realize that. So we are always seeking to join in with other people so we can raise our share of voice for NCDs in our countries. Hello? Great. Thank, thanks, Tati. So, so I can understand that you're um, doing a lot of valuable work advocating to government to, um, to, to raise diabetes as a health priority um, up, up their priority tree, but also to take specific actions. Uh, but you also mentioned in your presentation that you, you do a lot of training activities as well yourself. Doesn't that make your whole cost model rather unsustainable? Yeah, I, actually, I like I liked, uh, that question because if you look at the model that we used, uh, Tom, is that uh, we, know, we know that uh, to be sustainable, we can't take the whole load of training. So where we work, what we do is we, in the 27 counties, we have a training model where we have identified physicians uh, who come together to be taught on how to train uh, diabetes uh, to the younger and junior doctors. So each physician in turn goes to their county and adopts uh, a number of physicians around the facility where he works. And uh, they train these trainers to be trained uh, TOTs, what is called as TOTs, who in, who in turn go and make change at the facility level. So it's sort of uh, 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 in, in, in two tiers. 
we have the physicians who are more knowledgeable and uh, more experienced, but we know that they can't reach everyone. So we invest in these ones. And in turn, our, our, our partners who own the hostels host the other trainings and bring the trainings together, uh, the trainees together, so they can be taught how to make the, a difference at the primary healthcare level. And that's why we're able to train um, uh, up to, uh, actually this year I think it's even going to more than 800 doctors. As, at, as the end of this year. So the trainings are, are in, two, in two levels. Otherwise, if we do it at once, it would be unsustainable for us. Yes. Great, thank you very much. And, and Pramod, we've had a, a similar question um, from, our, from one of our attendees for you, really, but put, put, put in the terms of your, um, your private sector ownership structure. Um, and I guess the question is around, um, you know, in a similar way to my question to Dorothy, you know, is it, is it really um, something that you should be doing as a company? You know, is it, is it not something that um, is, is actually going to take away from shareholder value? Um, the question actually is how can com companies keep investors happy while building inclusive models? So are you, are you, are you sure that this is something that you, you really should be doing as a company? I think uh, the answer to your question, uh, answer to this question is yes and no. Uh, and... Uh, the company, uh, IKEA as a company, believes and uh, that sustainability is an integrated part of the business. And also that our business should have positive impact on people as well as planet. Which means that we have the responsibility uh, uh, to, uh, to have the lesser and lesser impact of our business, both on people and planet. Now, 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 the fact is that while we are doing this activity at our own level, A, I had mentioned during my uh, talk that we have created non-competitive uh, forums uh, where we are working together. But at the same time, we do realize that even as a corporate or a company, we do have limitation. And hence, for upscaling or making it a, 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 a big uh, part of the um, agriculture process, we need to work with the government, and there is no real uh, doubt about it. But the second part is also important. We are also aware that if we have to reach the 30% of global production and 5 million farmers and 9 million hectares of cotton land, it's not the same model who is, which is going to work. We have to work with the government because they have far bigger reach in terms of farmers and the resources. But also we need to bring in the technology because the traditional model of uh, reaching out to the farmer and providing the information, it has a limitation in terms of how much you can reach with the given resources. And here the technology plays a very, very important role. Uh, as one of the speaker was saying, whether it is mobile technology, whether it's some kind of an app, we need to bring in this aspect. And, and then only we can reach those many numbers which we are planning to reach out in the different parts of the world. Uh, otherwise, I might uh, retire before we reach even, say, 3 million, uh, you know, or 2 million farmers. And that's the way uh, we need to go forward. Uh, and whereas my wish is that I want to see that by 2020 we reach these goals and uh, tip the market uh, towards, uh, towards uh, creating a new norm for both textile industry as well as for the cotton farming. While we're talking about farmers, um, we have had a question which I think is, is, is quite quite interesting around um, dependency. Um, mm -hmm. The question is, you know, how, how do you ensure that you don't create dependency from both the companies but also the suppliers in the supply chain when you're going down such a sort of specific route in terms of the kinds of um, products you're looking for? Very, very interesting question. Uh, and here we are challenging the traditional notion of uh, any sustainable initiative. Traditionally, the, uh, the belief or the behavior has been that any sustainability initiatives both ties up the seller as well as the buyer, uh, whether the farmer or the, say, the next level in the value chain, which is gin if we consider it, or for that matter, spinning or weaving. 
What we have said in this process is that though we are working uh, along with our partners in the field, the farmers are free to sell whosoever offers them the best price. Till they practice the sustainable farming practices, it is fine with us. At the same time, our supply chain partners are also free to buy whichever suits them the best price. Now then the question arises that how do we make sure that the cotton ends up in our product as well as in our value chain? And this we learned pretty big early in, the, uh, uh, in our journey that it is the best of our effort and best of our efforts of supply chain partners, we can only access not more than 25% of the cotton in our value chain. However, even if we don't access the rest of the farmers, if they are following the sustainable farming practices, and cotton is uh, traded in the world, and the project cotton or sustainable cotton is traded in the world as conventional cotton, the world is still a better place. And hence, both given the fact that there is so much of volatility in the cotton market, both grower of the cotton as well as the buyer in the value chain are free to buy or sell whosoever offers them the best price. And this, by doing this, what we have done is we have not created a dependency on one or another actor. What we are creating here is a market mechanism which plays by the market law, but at the same time, the sustainable cotton travels along the value chain. Hmm. Does it, yeah? Um, so really what you're saying, I, I really liked your, your, your piece around that the world would still be a better place even if they don't sell into, into your supply chains. Um, but presumably mm -hmm. you do have mechanisms for actually tracking the extent to which um, you are getting that cotton into your supply chains, because otherwise you might find it hard to know whether actually you're, and, you know, you know, you're able to even make the claim that the, the cotton that you're growing is sustainably produced, wouldn't you? Uh, and that's, uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, the most important part here is that we do have a traceability and tracking system, A. But again, the most part, important part is that if you, and you have brought out a very important point here, if you look at, again, the any, uh, I will talk about the cotton uh, initiatives, any traditional cotton initiative, generally there has been a label, labeled attached to the product, that this product is made out of sustainable raw material. But we have reasoned it out. That you do only in case when you have done a part of your range offered to the customer in sustainable raw material. If you are converting whole of your range from sustainable raw material, then do you need to really label it? You definitely need to track it and trace it, but do you need to label it? And think of it like this. I, I'm sure you have visited IKEA store and the amount of textiles which we have. How difficult it is from the IKEA co-workers' point of view to remember out of those many products that this one is from sustainable raw material and the other one is not. And hence, this decision makes perfect sense, at least to us, that convert all ranges. And what this does is, is basically that any customer who buys with whatever size of wallet has the access to the product made out of sustainable raw material, but at the same time, it takes away the care of the label but we don't compromise on the fact that there, it definitely needs to be trace and track system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I think we could go on talking about this, uh, and perhaps we would in a minute, um, Pramod, but I'd just like to also bring in Dorothy again, and we've got a couple of questions, Dorothy, which I think are also uh, really interesting. So you, you talked a lot about um, collaborative models, I think, in what you said and how important it is to partner um, with all kinds of different organizations, I think, um, as you talked about in your presentation. Um, so a couple of questions. Firstly, to what extent do the, your partners actually co-invest with you in your activities? Um, and secondly, um, to what extent do you see um, uh, a breakdown or, or a difference between partnering with governments and partnering with uh, civil, so, civil society organizations? And what do you think you get from um, both of those groups in terms of uh, addressing constraints to scale? Uh, yes, of course, uh, if you partner with uh, the government and you partner with maybe a private sector company, 
you the experience is different. Uh, so we, uh, for sure, have partnered with some private companies. Uh, for example, uh, we partnered with a, we can partner with a company like Roche, where their expertise is uh, diagnostics because we don't make diagnostic diagnostic equipment. So we ask them, what can you bring to the table to support our patients to access uh, uh, the, uh, uh, affordable diagnosis, blood sugar tests and the strips and the HbA1c, things like that. So basically, at that level, uh, when we agree, uh, some sometimes the, the partners can, you know, give at this at a price, and sometimes we have to buy um, initially for the for the project, and then we expect our, our facilities to sustain with what they raise from uh, the strips that we bought for them. So it depends on uh, uh, on the partner that we have. The private sector partners will support initially, but of course they will not give uh, free diagnostic equipment for many years. So we have to have a sustainable partnership. So initially they would give uh, some, and then uh, we if we buy, we hope that in the next coming years, the, the facilities will be able to continue buying, and this same diagnostic partner will benefit because once you have a glucometer, you have to buy the strips for a long time. You understand that? So uh, I don't know if you know anything about like blood, blood sugar testing. So a private company, if they give me a glucometer, then I have to keep on testing my sugar for the rest of my life. Ideally, I should be buying the strips and also uh, having them make something for me buying the strips in the long term. So that's for the private sector. Uh, for a group like uh, Kenya Defeat Diabetes Association, of course, uh, we have to support them in the initiative. What we in turn get is that they are able to train other diabetes patients to be peer educators. And you know that we believe that uh, uh, the patient needs to be educated on how to manage their disease. So in the long term, these patients act as um, psychosocial support to other patients and help us uh, form diabetes support groups, which in turn help the patient adhere to their treatment. So that's a benefit that we get as a project. Maybe not in monetary terms, but we do get patients who are committed to their treatment and who are educated, and who know how to manage their disease because we have people who can reach them where we, we are not able to reach them. So when you partner with uh, such a group, we benefit in that way. And when you partner with government, uh, government is just government. You have to be patient. And uh, what they help us with is just uh, also advocating and, uh, and, uh, and helping us to create awareness at a national level and supporting our activities and endorsing our activities. Because if you have the goodwill of the Ministry of Health, when you have protocols developed to be taken to facilities, then they look bona fide, they look genuine. So we also need that goodwill from the government that we are doing the right thing, because in the end, the whole country benefits if you have a healthy people. So when we partner with all these stakeholders, we get different benefits uh, from them, like I've, uh, like I've just discussed. I don't know if I've answered your question right, Tom. <laughs> Sorry, that, was a, that was a really, really interesting answer. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, you answered it very well, I think. Um, and I'd like to ask, actually ask the same question really of Pramod, because I think what you're doing in terms of addressing the, you know, this transformation of the cotton market as you're, as you're doing um, clearly is a highly collaborative activity as well, um, given that, you know, as you've, as, you've, as you've so clearly mentioned, that it's, it's about creating demand, not, 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 not just by IKEA's activities, but by any other buyer in the market. And, and also um, supply challenges will be addressed not only by yourselves, but by a whole variety of government and non-governmental partners. So how, how do you see um, collaboration and the benefits of different kinds of collaboration in terms of addressing the constraints in, the, in these markets? I think if I begin from the fact that collaboration with the uh, uh, with the means, I will divide the answer with the three kinds of collaboration. A is with the supply chain partner, B with the NGO partners, and C with the government. And if I look into the collaboration with the uh, with the with the supply chain partners, it has not been easy, and that is because it is about changing the business behavior. It was about convincing them. It was about making them realize the importance of looking beyond the obvious, looking beyond their P&L uh, in short term and looking really at the long term. And to tell you very honestly, though we collaborate with lots and lots of uh, supply chain partners, but I still do the sales pitch for the sustainable cotton even after one decade with some of the, some of the supply chain partners. 
With regard to the uh, non-governmental organization, uh, I think that collaboration has been really smooth. And obviously, again, there were categories where some of the non-governmental organization were really uh, enthusiastic in uh, joining us. But, uh, uh, but at the same time, there were uh, certain governmental organizations who came on board slightly late, uh, given the fact that they had to, um, they had to uh, get convinced first. And one of the learning in the process was we thought that while we are collaborating with the non-governmental organization, it will be even difficult to convince the farmer to collaborate on this journey. But to our surprise, that has been the really, uh, really uh, smooth journey. And that is why the numbers are increasing every year and the farmers are willing to join. And what has been, uh, yeah, I mean, so now I can say when I look into posterity that the collaboration with the supply chain partners has not been that easy and smooth, right? Now, coming back to the government, one of the things we have realized is that the initiatives like we, which we are doing, is a, a, a mono-commodity. It's a one-commodity collaboration which we are thinking. But when you talk to the government, when you start collaborating with the government, government doesn't look at these uh, these uh, these initiatives from a lens of a mono uh, mono commodity or one commodity. They have to always look into the fact of the say whole cropping cycle and hence. And once you start discussing them, then it becomes uh, sometimes I must say uh, that your scope and their scope doesn't actually match. And there you need to find a common ground with the government to start working there. And it's also, there is always, I can say, that at least from the, from the retailers or corporate part of it, there has been certain amount of skepticism in the initial years with the government agencies. They look at it like, yeah, this is a business enterprise and this cannot be an enterprise which is inclusive in nature. And it takes certain amount of years and efforts uh, for government to get convinced. But again, that difference in the scope where they look into the complete uh, crop cycle or complete year cycle versus initiatives like ours where we are only looking at the cotton, that difference is still persists and it's a work in progress. The second part again, and that comes from the, it's the derivative of the first point as well, that when you work for a particular commodity or a crop, you try to uh, create a group or isolate a group of farmers who are growing cotton. But when government goes into that, they don't create that distinction. A farmer, whatsoever he or she grows, is a farmer. And that also can create sometime, uh, sometime a, a challenge. And to put it simply, we work with the cotton farmer, but they work with the farmer. And that's the difference in the approach comes. And it takes a quite many number of, I think, time and effort to get to a common ground. And I will say that that, ha that is a kind of a journey uh, which we are on and which we have achieved certain success in some of the geographies of uh, cotton growing geographies and which is work in progress. I will not say that we have reached where we wanted to be in terms of collaboration with the government. Thank you, Pramod. Again, a fascinating um, answer to my question. I, I'm very aware that we haven't really talked much about uh, Pranaka on this call. Um, now, reflecting on, on, on Pranaka's model, I can, I can see that it's a contract farming model. And, you know, even though perhaps it's not um, addressing a whole market at quite the same scale as, as our other two um, uh, contributors, um, as we know, there are, there's a wide range of different activities um, that need to be done to make these models work, some of which you might think would fall better under a government or NGO remit than, than a company themselves, um, which also introduces potentially the topic of um, collaboration. So um, I know that Gabby is, um, has been uh, asked to drill in at late notice, but, but we also have Tatiana on the call who is um, also a little bit familiar with Pranaka's model. So I wonder if one of you would mind just giving us some comments really on this whole issue of you know, what is appropriate for a company to do? How can it collaborate with others to address gaps in what it's able to, able to provide in order to you know, bring forward a comprehensive model such as contract farming uh, that addresses all the constraints in the market? 
Hi, Tom. So what I can do is I can uh, give everyone a brief overview of uh, Pronaka's model, which I think um, is a great model, particularly coming from um, one of the countries that's not known yet for inclusive business, which is Ecuador. So I just wanted to uh, give everyone a little bit sort of like a taste of what they're doing and encourage everyone to learn more about the company. And I will chat everyone our um, email address. So if you have any further questions, you can send them to me and I'll be happy to pass them on to um, Pronaka to Javier to answer. He, he said he would be happy to do that. So really, Pronaka's goal is to reduce import dependence and strengthen the supply chain of maize production. So Pernaca works with Ecuador's small and medium farmers um, from indigenous and local populations. And those often uh, lack basic education and access to finance. And so therefore they cannot negotiate better prices um, with the so-called middlemen for their products or increase productivity. So Pernaca really changed um, the dynamics of this marketplace by uh, buying directly from the farmers and by providing them with financial assistance, such as um, access to better seeds and other supplies, and also technical training um, on better agricultural practices. And a part of their uh, current initiative with the Business Call to Action, what Pranaka is doing is that uh, Pranaka is working uh, with farmers um, in the coastal region of uh, Ecuador, which, uh, which include Balsar, Mocachi, and Ventana. Uh, these areas have natural conditions that are optimal for mice production and because poverty in those areas is greater, um, Pranaka ensures that the farmers in, in the supply chain, uh, what they do is one, they have um, opportunity to receive credit um, so that they can buy uh, certified seeds, fertilizer and other agricultural inputs. Two is uh, they gain access to training on new technologies, better management practices, agriculture sustainability and et cetera. And the third aspect is uh, once farmers close the agriculture cycle, Pranaka um, helps them to measure their productivity and guarantees that uh, the per guarantees that 100% of the product is purchased. And in the purchasing process, the farmers are guaranteed fair weight measurements and fixed prices, etc. So really, farmers see Pranaka as their business partner, not uh, just merely a buyer, uh, because the process has changed in the life of so many of them, um, and um, really helps in alleviating poverty and helps um, uh, farmers increase their productivity in the process. So this is a bit of a some sort of my synopsis of the initiative of, of what Pranaka does. Unfortunately, um, I can't go into too many details, but I'd be happy to share more insight on behalf of the company um, later on um, by email and through our communication to all of the registered participants. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, thank you, Tatiana, for giving us that uh, that that taste. And I'm sure uh, people who want to know more can get more information, as you say. Um, we have one more question, which is um, which is a very difficult question, but certainly worth asking. Um, but luckily, I think uh, Dorothy and Pramod, you don't have too much time to, to grapple with it. Um, and the question is, um, given that we've talked so much about sort of system level change and transformational change in the two markets where you operate, how do you measure your impact? Any thoughts on how you measure your impact when you're working at this system level? Who wants to go first? The question is to all of us. Dorothy, um, yes, if you wouldn't mind, it's to you and to Pramod, really. So how, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to change the whole um, uh, market around um, uh, addressing diabetes. And you talked a lot about all the different um, aspects of the system that you work in. So how do you actually measure change is the question. Yeah, that's indeed a, a difficult question. <laughs> because we have been asking ourselves in the office uh, 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 that uh, we need to have an impact study. That is uh, somebody independent from us to really um, assess the impact of BOP uh, after this is our fourth year in Kenya. So uh, that is yet to be done, but I think it's in the pipeline. But so far what I can say is that uh, we really have seen a uh, change in behavior uh, uh, from the, for example, uh, the trainings we have done. Because uh, with the myths and misconception about diabetes, and especially on insulin, we find patients and, and uh, doctors who are now saying, I didn't know it was this easy to, to, to control diabetes. And that is a change that we would like to see because the, the patients who are not treated to target are the ones who end up getting complications and end up really dying prematurely. So when you have a critical mass of the uh, doctors that we have trained saying that 
now we are able, I know what to, to do when a patient has his blood sugar. I know which insulin to initiate, which oral drug to uh, to initiate. I know how to measure uh, the control in one year or two years or two years of the patient. So that is the behavior change we are actually uh, really uh, glad that we are seeing. Even though it has not been measured, but when I travel to the 27 counties, I hear these reports every day that uh, that patients are being uh, are being treated to target, not just being treated uh, uh, blankly. Initially, what used to happen is just a refill of prescriptions, refill year in, year out, the same medicine. The patient has a rotten foot, the prescription is the same. What we are seeing now is that doctors are able to now monitor the disease and treat an individual patient to target according to the patient's needs. And that is a big achievement for the project, and we hope uh, in the future we'll be able to provide some uh, objective uh, impact assessment from a, a study. But as of now, this has not been done yet. Great. Thanks, Dorothy. And Pramod, you must have exactly the same challenge um, to really understand how all your activities are changing these uh, markets that you are impacting on. Yes, and, and one of the ways, um, is, uh, while Dorothy was speaking, I was uh, thinking around it, and one of the things which we, uh, we try to see it now, and there are two examples of it. One was that when the volume of sustainable cotton was really low, the, the supply chain partners used to stock the cotton for the whole year so that they can supply it in the uh, sustainable cotton. But now what has happened is that because we have reached a certain level, they don't need to stock. It is available in all the geographies, in all the hemispheres of the world. That's a part of it. The B part is, and that's interesting observation made by one of our business leaders, or uh, it was asked in a common forum, where he asked that is there a price differential between the, uh, between the conventional or sustainable cotton? The traditional logic says yet. But to hear from the supply chain partners and unanimous know that there is no difference, it does indicate that there is a change happening in the market, both in terms of availability as well as in terms of price, if I have to say. And the third part is there are several independent studies and uh, by few universities being carried out on the Sustainable Cotton Initiative. But one of the things which we are observing, and again, uh, it will come out from the independent studies, but one of the things which we are observing as of now is that there have been uh, uh, farmers who are not part, even part of the project, but they are adopting the practices of better management practices or sustainable farming practices, learning from their neighbors. And hence, what has happened, at least in terms of indicators, I will say, not in terms of impact as such, but in terms of project indicator, what is happening, every year we carry out this um, gap between conventional and the, um, uh, and the project farmers. And if you ever take the sample of the neighborhood farmers, the gap is reducing year after year, which does tell that there is certain level of change taking place at the farming levels in terms of volume available and as well as also in terms of business behavior in the people. But this needs to be again confirmed with the formal independent studies, impact evaluation studies as Dorothy said. Great, thank you very much. Um, once again, you, you, you've provided uh, both of you some um, really fascinating answers to that very, very difficult question that we all grapple with. Um, and that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who's um, hung on in there and, uh, and joined the call. Thank you for those of you who posted questions. I think we've managed to answer most of them. Um, but as we're saying, you can um, send us other questions, or if your questions weren't answered well or adequately, then please also follow up with our, with our panelists. Um, and I think you have the address there to um, contact, contact them through the BCTA. So I'd like to just thank um, our panelists, um, Gabby, for stepping in at the last minute to make the presentation to Pramod and Dorothy, who've um, given us some really fascinating information um, about your, your initiatives and really, really helped us to understand how you are going to scale and addressing the many challenges along the way. Um, and with that, I'd just like to um, wish you all the best, uh, best wishes of the season and um, speak to you again, I hope.